Well, good morning. And yes, I know I've already been asked a hundred times, what's the special occasion? What's going on? Why are you wearing a tie? And I'm like, well, it's a time to celebrate because the kids go back to school tomorrow. So we're putting on our Sunday best and we're celebrating. But no, I just, you know, every now and then you just got to wear a tie. I don't know. I, I just felt like it today. There's really no rhyme or reason to it. It's just is what it is. So if you have your Bibles, which I hope you do, you can begin turning to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. You can go to the middle of your Bible and you'll fall probably around Psalms or Proverbs. If you fall in Proverbs, go back to your left a little bit to Psalm. Psalm 119 is where we're going to start today. For the month of August, we're going to be looking at theology and doctrine. And then, beginning in September, we're going to start going through the book of 1 Corinthians. So, but this Sunday, what we're going to do is we're going to look at this, just what theology is and what it means. And theology simply just means the study of God. Next week, we're going to be looking at the Trinity. And then the next week, we're going to be looking at the Trinity in our salvation, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, how they all interact and work in and through our salvation to bring us to saving faith. And then on the fourth Sunday of August, we're going to be looking at sound doctrine, how that's an overflow of good theology. So when it comes to thinking about this idea of theology and the study of God and all those things, something came, what came to my mind is being an expert in something. And started looking up, researching how much effort does it take to become an expert in any particular field. Well, in athletics, they say typically you want about 10,000 reps before you can begin to say that you've perfected something or you've put in enough time. That's why it's a big deal when you get to a pitcher or you get to a batter or you get to a quarterback and they're like, well, we're going to change his throwing motion or his swing. Well, the thing is, it takes like thousands upon thousands of reps to perfect that and that could set them back. Then I started thinking like, well, what about when it comes to, say you want to get a PhD in something? On average, to get a PhD, you spend seven to 8,000 hours reading. Just seven to 8,000 hours of reading is the, is the typical PhD. The typical you know, tender, uh, tenured professor has read somewhere between 13 and 14,000 hours on average. Now, some read less, some read more, but that's kind of it. You start thinking about this idea of being you know, just an expert in a particular field. And then we come to theology. Now, I know theology is one of those words a lot of people say, like, well, I don't get into all that theology stuff. Well, I don't really do that. I don't really do this with that or all that doctrine stuff. And you can hear pastors or you can hear churches or Christians say, well, like, no, we don't get into that. We just, we just focus on Jesus. Well, the reality is theology literally just means the study of God. And in reality, every human that has ever existed or will exist is a theologian. Now the question is, is are you a good one or a bad one? But every human is a, is a theologian in the sense that we're all studying to know who God is like and who he is. We get a bunch of world religions. There's all different types of religions. And that's efforts for people trying to know who God is. They're theologians. They're bad ones, but they're theologians. Even atheists are theologians in the sense that they've studied to show it and they come to the conclusion there is no God. Again, they're just bad theologians. So theology is extremely important to every person because it's studying to know who God is. And we need to know who God is. So if you ever come across people like, oh, theology is not that big of a deal. You can be like, actually, theology is the study of God that is a kind of a really big deal. So the question becomes like, okay, if we're supposed to be good theologians, and we're supposed to study who God is, where do we go? Well, I'm glad you asked. Psalm 119, we're going to be looking at verses 9 through 16. Now I'm going to go ahead and warn you now. There's going to be a lot of verses I referenced today. I will have them on the screen. 
They're also listed in your worship guide if you got one of those. Um, but I'll try, I'm, I'm going to have those up on the screen when I jump around. But starting off Psalm 119, verse 9 through 16. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. With all my heart I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Your word I have treasured in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have told of all the ordinances of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and regard your ways. I shall delight in your statutes. I shall not forget your word. In our efforts to know who God is, God has graciously given us his word. And he's revealed himself to us so that we can know him. That's the whole purpose of the word of God is God revealing himself to us so that we can know him. So we can become good theologians. We can study and know who God is. Very specifically there, looking back at verse 10. With all my heart I have sought you. Do not, let me want, do not let me wander from your commandments. See, God's commandments, his word that is given, allows us to seek after God with all our heart. See, again, that's one of the purposes that we're given God's word is so we can seek after God. In verse 11, it talks about your word of I treasure in my heart that I may not sin against you. See, again, it's that reminder that we're, we're taking God's word put in our heart so that we can have this relationship with our Heavenly Father so that we can know Him. So that we can have, be in right relationship with Him. And then in verses 12 through 16... We see that our need to meditate upon, to think about, to rejoice in, to learn from God's word. Why? So that we can know who God is. That's the whole point of coming to the word of God is to know him. Now, yes, when God's word speaks of times and places, and we can go to archaeology and we can find that the Bible plays out to be true. And we can see that, oh yeah, when it speaks of archaeology or when it speaks of science, it, the scripture's always true on those fronts, but the Bible's not just an archaeology book. It's just not a science book. It's, a, it's God revealing himself to his people so that we can know him. And so that's why we come to the word of God. We come not to get a list of do's and don'ts, not to be able to... Dis- the apologetics, yes, apologetics is important and good, but that's not why we're coming to the Bible. We're coming to the Bible to get to know our Heavenly Father, to know God, and to be able to walk with Him and enjoy Him, just like God intended it when He created us in the Garden of Eden. He put us in the Garden of Eden, and it says that He was walking in the Garden with them. The whole point of you being created, me being created, so that we can be in fellowship with God, and God has graciously given us His Word so that we can be good theologians, so we can study who God is, so we can know Him, so we can walk with Him. Cammie and I are coming up on our anniversary tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow. And so it's going to be 19 years. Now, over the course of the 19 years of marriage and the three years of dating before that, we've, we've got to know each other fairly well. Okay, and we can pick up each other's moves. We can pick up each other's cues. We can understand those things a little bit. Over time, listening, spending time together, you just get to know her. It's the same with God. When we come to his word, we're reading it so we can get to know him, so we can walk closer and closer and closer. Going into year 19, there's no way I'd go back to year one. Year one, Jason, was not very smart on picking up cues. <laughs> Year 19, Jason's just a tiny bit better, but I'm going to take that tiny bit. The idea is it just increase, just as I get to know her and we get to know each other, it just deepens our relationship. So that's why we come to the Word. That's your primary reason you come to the Word of God is to deepen your relationship with your Heavenly Father, to know Him more intimately. 
See, God's word also makes us wise unto salvation. 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 15. You, however, continue in the things that you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Again, the Scriptures, a part of studying the Scriptures, so you make you wise into salvation so you can be made and brought into right relationship with God. Romans 10, 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. You go to the Bible to grow your faith, to increase that, to grow that relationship. See, how you come to the Bible actually kind of matters. We come to the Scriptures not to try to refute people, not try to, to refute the culture. That's, can the Bible do those things? Most certainly. But we come to know God. That's why you come to the Scriptures. That's why we study the Scriptures on Sunday morning. Not so that we can be like, oh, no, I got, no, I got something for that person over there. Oh, I got something for that group over there. Oh, yeah, we're going to get those Methodists. Hey, we're going to get those Presbyterians because we're Baptists. And see, this was right, right here. No, no, we are coming to the Scriptures so that we can know who God is and walk closer with Him. See, in Luke 24, in verses 44 through 45, it says, Now he said to them, that's Jesus, said to his disciples, These are my words which I have spoken to you while I was with you, that all the things that are written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. Now he breaks that down as all the, the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. So that's how the Hebrews broke down the Old Testament into those three broad categories. So he's saying he taught them of all the Old Testament, how all the Old Testament is about him. So that we can know him. So you can come to the scriptures, you can read it. So when you come to the story of David and Goliath, you're not kind of like, hey, I'm going to be a Goliath and I'm going to conquer my giants. No, you go and you look and you realize that I need a champion to fight on my behalf, and that is Christ. We come to the Old Testament, we come to the Scriptures, not to read other people into it, not to read ourselves into it, not to read the culture into it, but we come to know who God is. That's why we read the Bible. That's why God has given us the Scripture, so that we can know Him. But far too often, people use the Bible as like a self-help book. They come to me like, ah, oh, just give me something to make me feel better for the day. Ah, oh, give me something to be able to say or to refute or to respond or to, uh, how do I deal with these things? No, no you, you come to the scripture to know God. See, what we need to do is when you look at good theology, studying who God is, will build to sound doctrine, which will build to good works. So this idea of good theology, studying who God is, coming to the Bible to know who God is, is the foundation of all that will follow. You can't skip the steps. You've got to start at the very beginning. Good theology. You need to know who God is before you can do anything else. That's why Paul was discipled for three years before he went out and did anything or went out to do, plant even the first church or say the first thing or to preach in the center, he was discipled for three years. Jesus discipled the disciples for three years. You see that in Scripture. They take them under their wings and they would disciple them and lead them, teaching them all of who God is. Because once you understand who God is, then those other things will naturally fall into place. And you'll begin to understand what sound doctrine is and you'll be able to understand what good works are. It starts with knowing God, Ephesians 1.17. So Paul's coming to pray to the church, for the church of Ephesus. Now, the church of Ephesus faced a lot of persecution. All right? I mean, this is where people are stoned, they're imprisoned. The, the whole crowd in Acts, they gathered in the amphitheater. They were going to try to just kill all the Christians, get rid of these people. There was great opposition here in Ephesus. And so of all the things that Paul could have been praying for that church, praying for their deliverance, praying for their safety, praying for all those things, this is what he prayed. Through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he said, I'm praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and a revelation in the knowledge of him. To know 
him, to know God. That is our ultimate end. That's where we begin, that's where we start, and that's the foundation of the whole part of our life, is knowing God. Good theology is important. Not only important, it is necessary. God uses his, his word to draw us near. John 12, 32, and, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. Jesus said the goal is to draw people to myself. In John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that, you may know, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you've sent. In John 17, that's when Jesus begins to pray, and he prays for the disciples. He prays for future believers. He's praying for me and for you and all those who would believe, and he's praying that they understand what eternal life is, and that is to know God. Knowing God is so valuable. It can't be overstated. We come to the Scriptures, and if you find yourself reading the Scriptures, and you find yourself like, ah, Jack needs to read this part. Oh, I hope Colleen's listening on this one. You know, it, if you're coming thinking of what other people need to hear, you're coming to the Scriptures in the wrong manner. If you're just opening the Scripture like, hey, I just want to know how to have a better life here. You're like, no, 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 that's not what we do with the Scriptures. What we do with the Scriptures is we come to know Him. We're praying that, God, would you give me a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. Help me to know you. That's why we come to the Scriptures, is to know God. And once you lay that base of good theology, where you're coming and you're knowing God, then that can build to sound doctrine. Which sound doctrine just means good teachings. In Titus uh, 1.9 it says, Holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so he may be able to both exhort and sound doctrine refute those who contradict. Part of the role of the pastors is to have sound doctrine. That's, what, that's who Titus is, Paul is addressing there at Titus is the elders, the pastors. They're supposed to exhort with sound doctrine, refute those who contradict. But you can't understand sound doctrine and refute with sound doctrine and protect the church from false doctrine if you don't understand who God is. Even after they got to know you, we have the Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now we tend to stop there. Hey, go make disciples. Get them baptized. Awesome. But he continues in verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. See, sometimes what we do is we want to stop at the relationship. Okay, I got the relationship with God, so I don't want to go on to sound teaching. And then sometimes what we do is we want to skip the relationship and jump to sound teaching. Hey, I'm going to do all this. I'm going to focus on this teaching, but not so much a relationship with God. So yes, doctrine, instructions, those things are extremely important. But all those doctrines and all those teachings and all those things about how we are to live and what we are to do, what we are to believe is rooted and knowing who God is. Meaning, you can't understand sound doctrine if you don't know who God is. That's why we tell new believers, get into the Word. Just read the Word. Consume the Word. Get into the Word. Because you need to learn who God is. Learn His character. Learn His attributes. You learn those things. And then sound doctrine will come. And then good works will come. But again, even our good works is rooted in a relationship with Christ. In Ephesians 2, 8-10, through 10, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and as not of yourselves is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God prepared for Him that we would walk in them. Good works in Christ Jesus. Again, even our good works, our sound doctrine, all is rooted in a personal relationship with God. It has to start with knowing who God is before you can move on to the right teachings and move on to doing the right works. Because good works ultimately is just an overflow of a personal relationship with God. We see that in Galatians 5, 22 through 26, when it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no, there is no law. 
Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. See, our good works, what we determine to be good or not good or uh, acceptable or not acceptable is not, does not originate in our own minds and our hearts and our thoughts and our understandings. It is all rooted in who God is. You see, what the problem is, is a lot of people begin to flip that. What they do is they, they start with good works and they think, well, if you do good things, that must mean you believe good things, which means that you know who God is. Which doesn't work. That's why we have all these different types of religions. We have all these different types of beliefs that float out there. And people tend to justify those away because of it. They do good things. So they must believe the right things. Which means they know who God is. The problem with using good works... As a measure, if someone understands the teachings of God or understands and knows who God is, is that our good works aren't really good works. See, in Isaiah 64, 6, it says, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. When you look at good works from a human perspective, we end up calling a lot of things good that aren't really good. This is how cults get started. This is how false teachers and false teachings and all these things can move freely in and out of the churches and amongst us and things like that because we get fixated on, well, they do the right thing or they say the right thing, therefore they must understand the right things and they must know who God is. We start backwards. Your good works or your knowledge is not an indication that you know who God is. And that's what we've got to be careful of. It's trying to start, well, if I just am a better person, then I will be, God will love me more, or God will will accept me more, or I will understand more, or... I'm going to get my life together first, then I can come to God. The problem with that train of thinking is that you will never be good enough to come to God. Because all our righteousness is as filthy rags before a holy God. So we can't start with good works. We can't start with good teachings. We have to start with theology. We have to start with understanding who God is. Your good works cannot replace a personal relationship with God. Knowing the right things cannot replace a personal relationship with God. I have known many brilliant people. They knew a lot of things. But they just didn't know who God was. There's a lot of people who, in the world's eyes, they do a lot of good things. But they just don't know who God is. So when it comes to being a good theologian, you want to study who God is, you want to know who God is, Scripture becomes your best friend. You come to the Scriptures... To know God. That's why you come. That's why we emphasize read the Bible. So that you can know who God is. Next, I want you to turn to with me to Hebrews chapter 1. If you were in the New Testament... Kind of towards the back of the New Testament. So scripture 
we're all theologians, so a theologian's best friend is Scripture. We also see that Jesus is the theologian's light that leads us to God to know Him more so we can understand Him. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 through 4, It says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the, and the prophets and in many portions in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sin, he sat down to the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels, as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. Jesus is the exact expression of his nature. See, again, God wants us to know him. So he's given us his word, and he's given us Jesus, so that we can know who God is. So to know Jesus is to know God. If you understand who Jesus is, then you're going to understand who the Father is, and you're going to understand who the Holy Spirit is, and you're going to get this understanding of who the Godhead is in the Trinity. Now, before we trace that rabbit trail, we're going to get into the Trinity next week. So you can put that in the back of your mind. But Jesus is essential to knowing who God is. He's given us the scriptures so that we can know him. And he's given us Jesus to light the way so that we can walk with God. See, in John 14, 6-7, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Why is Jesus the way, the truth, and the life? So that you can be a better person. So you can understand the difference between right and wrong. No, so that you can know God. So you can know who he is. That's the whole point of Jesus is to bring you into fellowship with God. But see, without Jesus, it's impossible to get to that relationship. It doesn't matter how sincere maybe Buddhists or Hindus or Muslims are. They will never get to God. They will always forever be bad theologians because they're not coming through Jesus. Jesus is the only, ro- only way. There's not many roads to God. God has laid it out. It's Jesus and Jesus alone because there's no other name. On heaven and earth or below the earth, which man may be saved. It's only Jesus. See, once we have Jesus, we continue to walk with him and follow him. And he brings us into that deeper, more intimate relationship with God. See, in John 15... 9 through 10, Jesus was telling his disciples, Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. You want to abide with Jesus and be able to abide with the Father, to have that intimate, close relationship. Here, when it says, Keep my commandments, it's talking about his word. You go to his word, you go to the scriptures. Just like the psalmist we read in Psalm 119, I hide your word in my heart that may not sin against you. I want to abide in that love with God. And it comes back to reading God's word. There in verse 10 of John 15, he says, if you keep my commandments. That word keep there literally means like to guard or watch over. So it was like, it, that was used more in the Greek. It was used more of a military type term, like someone at the gate. They would watch over they would keep watch, and so it's like you keep, you, you're keeping people safe, you're, you're keeping an eye out, and all those type of things. So that, that Greek word was usually associated with this idea of being on guard, being prepared, being ready. We keep God's word. We guard it, just like the psalm said, I hide it in my heart. You memorize it, you meditate upon it, you keep it close, you watch over it, you make it a part of your life. Why? So you can abide in the love of God. So you can abide with him and walk with him. See, as you understand more and more and more of who God is, 
the teachings and the good works are just going to be a, and just kind of like a byproduct. It's just a natural result. Which means that if in your life you don't see the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, if you don't see those things in your life, that means the problem, the root problem of that is your personal relationship with God. But see, what happens is a lot of people try to spend all their time like, well, I'm going to try to be more patient. I'm going to try to be more faithful. I'm going to try to be more self-controlled. Well, okay, you're going to fail at that. Go abide in love of Christ. Walk with Him. Read His Word to know God. Because you, as you deepen that relationship, the fruit of the Spirit is just going to be a natural. You don't have to make it happen. It just happens. You don't have to worry about good teachings because it just happens as a result of a relationship. The reason you see a lot of cults come out with crazy teachings is because they don't have a relationship with God to begin with. That's where it begins and that's where it ends for all of us. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, it talks about how all Scripture is inspired by God and useful and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness. So the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. You go back to the scriptures to know God, and the rest will be taken care of. So if you're in a point where you're struggling with some of the fruit of the Spirit being active in your life, or if your marriage is struggling, or you've got friendships that are struggling, The starting point is going back to your personal relationship with God and understanding who He is. Because what you understand of who God is is going to impact what you believe and ultimately impact what you do. And the reason you need God's word, another reason you need God's word is Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The reason why our clever sayings, well, if we just word it like this, then that will change them. Or if I just, if I just can, if we get the right church sign, or if we just, if we get the right just event, or the right ministry, if we just, if we just, if we tweak like, or if we, hey, if we got rid of the pews and put chairs in, or if we, hey, if we went to an organ, or if we got rid of the organ, or if we changed the color of the carpet, then people will come and we'll see lives changed. No. God's word is what changes people because the only hope of changing of someone changing is getting into a personal relationship with God. So if you're having struggles or you can't move and you feel like you're hitting walls and you're not moving in your faith, you go back to a personal relationship with God. You don't try to be a better person. You try to get to know God. You come to Jesus. That's why we're told to fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So yes, all of you this morning, including myself, we're all theologians. The question is, are you a good one or a bad one? And when you start thinking about what it takes to be an expert in a particular field, to think that you can just skim the Bible or just use it as a reference point, to use it as a science book or an archaeology book or an apologetic book or you can just use it here or there or maybe you only get the Bible on Sunday mornings or Wednesday nights or maybe, hey, I read a devotional book and I get one verse and then I listen to somebody else for the whole time or whatever. It, you're not going to move. I remember one of my New Testament, my New Testament theology class in seminary. We had to have 3,000 pages of reading. And that was a quarter. I had eight weeks. That was one of my four classes. It was brutal. 
Because you figure up the first day of the quarter, you figure up, okay, I need to read 125 pages every day. Then a couple weeks in, you're like, okay, I got to read 260 pages every day. <laughs> then you get in and be like, hey, I got to read 300 pages every day for the next four days. You know, and you just like, you just like, it's just so much reading and so much of these things. We come to God's word. We want to be good theologians. We want to know him. You're going to have to consume scripture to do that. I can't do it for you. Someone else can't do it for you. I'm not the Holy Spirit. You're not the Holy Spirit. Can't make it happen. You've got to come to the Word of God. And not half-heartedly, not flippantly, not just like, oh, where am I going to read today? Oh, look at that verse. Okay, great, awesome, moving on. No, you need to take time, like the psalmist said, meditate upon the Word of God. Memorize it. Hide it in your heart for the purpose of walking with the Lord. And then the right teachings and the good works will naturally follow. But walking with the Lord and knowing Him is all possible because of the gospel. The good news of Jesus truly is amazing good news. Because just like we read in Isaiah 64, 6, that all our righteousness is as filthy rags, So there's none who do good. No, not one. All have fallen short of the glory of God. We're all in the same boat. We're all sinners. And see, I think people forget, like when we stand before the throne one day and the white throne judgment and there's two groups, every sin that could ever be committed is going to be represented on both sides. The only difference between the two sides is in Christ, not in Christ. You're going to find murderers on both sides. You're going to find every sin represented on both sides of the throne. The difference is going to be Christ. And so if you're here today and you're kind of like, well, I don't know really about this religion thing. I've not really, I don't know much about Jesus. I don't, my, my life's a mess. All of us are broken and are messy. All of us are sinners in need of the grace of God. The good news of Jesus is that you don't have to be good enough for God. God was good enough for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul comes and says, you know, he says, hey, remember the gospel that I first delivered unto you, that Jesus came and he died on the cross according to the scriptures. He was buried and rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Jesus came and died. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And because of the gospel, we can now repent and believe and be saved. As it says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess through your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not maybe, not hope so, you will be saved. And then you're able to walk with the Lord. 